record. Okay, okay. All right. So welcome back. Today, we're going to be talking about weight loss. So weight loss is something that is kind of, well, A, it's something that I kind of dealt with personally. So if you guys haven't heard my own story yet, um, it, what one of the parts of this is, uh, I was someone who was an athlete in college. Um, by the way, the link is in my bio. If you go check it out, the link is in my bio. It says link to join the Thursday calls, even though today's Friday, it will be Thursday going forward. Okay. With that out of the way. So, um, with that, Yes, my story. So weight loss. Weight loss is something that's near and dear to me. I, again, this is not meant to be something that is, you know, against the 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 body positivity type of movement here. That's not what this is about. I think there are aspects to the body positivity movement that are great. Um, but what I see is we're kind of entering this dangerous place where it's kind of going too far. And we have to understand that you can love yourself and heal and understand that there are risks that come along with being overweight. And that is, and there are things that you can fix with that. That's what this is all about. This is about helping and healing and bringing that stuff forward. This is not about, you know, trying to shame anyone or anything like that. This is about giving real practical solutions and more importantly, why this stuff happens. Why? And then, because if you understand why, then you understand how to fix it. So with that, what I want to do is actually kind of go through some of the stuff that I have here. And we'll, we'll kind of jump into it. So what I want to start with is like, you have to understand that, like, I believe the numbers like over 700, it might be close to like 800 million people worldwide are obese. And what we need to understand that this is a sign of an endocrine problem. There's an endocrine issue. So, you know, in other words, it's mostly a hormone problem. Yes, calories are going to play a role, particularly in the modern world where everything is super high in calories and not very high in anything else as far as nutrients and things that you need. This is partially why we tend to overeat a lot of processed foods or foods that are, are enriched or fortified with most of the time. It's actually usually like fake or synthetic versions of vitamins, which are not nearly as good as the naturally occurring ones. That should be no surprise. So what's happening then like that, like we're not getting what we need and, and why, you know, are there, are there an issue with our hormones? And this could be, digestion it could be pancreas related it could be a lot of things we're going to kind of cover it um but you know calories is the big thing that comes up so we have to kind of dispel that myth first now i'm going to share my screen quick here on zoom because you need to understand like where calories kind of come from or you know so what first of all what is a calorie we need to define that first so a calorie that you see on a food package is actually something known as a kilocalorie that's why it has the capital c so you'll notice that's not, that's never a typo a capital c is going to be something it is actually a kilocalorie and in other words 1000 lowercase c calories so a calorie all your you also see it sometimes as kcal is the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water, one degree Celsius. That is what a calorie is by definition. So with that in mind, like get the real, like essentially the concept, or at least if we try to put it in this mathematical framework, it's like you eat X amount of calories, you will gain, get X amount of energy. But if you have too much energy, then the rest will be stored as fat and that's it. The body's a calculator. That's kind of where it goes. Um, so, you know, that becomes a huge issue because if you look here at what a bomb calorimeter is, and this is what it is here. So you would put, you know, your food or, or whatever you're measuring kind of in here, it's surrounded by water and you see um 
that it it, it essentially causes a, a, a big problem here. So so that's ultimately like what's going on. And this water, when it rises in temperature, that's what that's what you would then call a calorie. What what how much energy do you need to do that? So it might not surprise you to think that this is not necessarily what digestion in the body kind of looks like. You're not actually burning food. That's what we we, we call it, or, or the, that's the colloquial term that's used, but that's not actually what's happening in the body. There are plenty of enzymes, things like pitolin, things like you know your actual teeth. There's mechanical breakdown. There's stomach acid. There's digestive enzymes from the pancreas and bile and and uh, proteolytic enzymes and amylases and lipases and all of these things that break down food. It's not the, it's not working like this thing would. That's not actually how it works. So just looking at food as if it's like, oh, it's a calorie in calorie out model. We already see like doesn't work. And, and yes, if you grossly overeat calories, which again, you are going to do if there is low quality calorie rich foods which are most of your processed foods that's yes that's going to be an issue but the other issue is there's energetics there's hormones there's so many other things that are involved here um one of the things i actually want to talk about i wrote about this a while back when i was still writing a book and i just kind of pulled the paragraph so you can see it here so there was actually a study done on 42 monkeys they split them into two groups and they fed them whoops how that happened What's going on? And they fed them the same amount of calories. Where'd I go? Here we go. The same amount of calories. And what they found, I don't want to leave the site. What's going on? Okay. Okay. Anyway, I don't know what's going on there. Um, and what they found was they were both fed the same amount of calories. They broke it down from, and they were changing the fats that they were eating. So one was given uh, more like natural vegetable oils, which on, as a side note are probably not great, but the others were given things like trans fats and artificial fats. And what they found, even though they uh, controlled for the amount of calories that they were given these monkeys, the ones with poorer lipid profiles, poorer heart markers, uh, gain more weight, despite the calories being controlled, were the ones on the poorer quality foods. So it can't just be, oh, it's, you know, um, it, it's the amount of calories, it's, you need to work out more, you need to like, and obviously that's something you should be doing, but it's not that simple. So we need to really understand like what actually causes weight gain. And like I said, and this old model, as we're kind of talking about of calories in, calories out, like does not work at the level that we're talking about where people are like measuring food on scales and, and all this. It, it, no, no. Like, yes, you can grossly overdo it, but we're not talking about that type of thing here. We're talking about generally speak, like if we're adding five more calories a day, that means you'll, you'll slowly weigh more. It's like, no, no. The goal really is to get healthy. And as we start getting healthy, the weight loss comes off. Why? Because excessive weight is actually excessive weight waste being excreted from the body. That's actually what's happening. And so, like for me, what was a big deal was when I was in um, chiropractic school, you know, I was just as active as I was when I played a sport in college. And despite that, during my time in college, I've talked about this. I put on like 25, 30 pounds. Um, one of the big issues that I dealt with at the time was I was struggling with a lot of other digestive issues, energy level, uh, at, like just whack, wacky kind of energy levels. Um, I developed seasonal allergies, which I never had before. And I just figured this was like part of getting older, which is preposterous when you consider the fact that I was like 20 at the time. Um, and, and even though my activity levels were still very high, I still kept putting on this weight and I thought it was just working out more, but like that was not the case. It was literally the quality of food was getting so much worse 
And, and there were obviously other things going on too, but that was such a big part of it. And I'll take that to the next step. So there's actually another study that I actually covered when I was writing this book. Um, they There was one study, they took 12,000 runners who subscribed to Runner's World magazine, which was a magazine back in the day. Actually, it still might exist. I'm not totally sure. Either way, they tried to find, they, they basically were polling about 12,000 of their subscribers. And they did a correlation between the distance ran and overall leanness. And, but they found like a disturbing trend. They found that regardless of how much these, these people ran, they were getting slowly fatter over time. They were putting on more weight over time. And they found essentially the study designers, like when they were doing their, their calculations, they eventually concluded that if every runner added an extra four to six kilometers per week, they would maintain a stable weight. Now, obviously that is ridiculous, um, but that needs that that is important to say because probably outside of running, a lot of these folks are not exactly living the healthiest lifestyles and that is playing a role. So like we tend to throw it to like, oh, we're getting older, or, oh, we're doing this and it's, it, it's not that and we're gonna get into why. Now it's gonna start with talking about the lymphatic system here um, and I got to actually pull up, actually, I'm going to add this graph because I need to kind of show you this because this is important. Um, let me get it up. I know this won't be great for YouTube, but that's all right. We're going to survive together here. I want to find a picture for you and add it so I can share it because this will be worth the wait in one second by the way if you're on instagram you go to the link in my bio you could join this live right now if you want in the zoom room so you can actually see what i'm talking about so i can share my screen and um you could see what i'm talking about which i think is kind of important okay because i am sharing diagrams and stuff so we have to talk about the kidneys we have to talk about the lymphatic system when it comes to weight loss first why because again a lot of excess weight is excess waste that we're holding on to. And it starts with our lymphatic system. So let me share my screen again. Okay. So we have this lymphatic system here. And the lymphatic system, so I've talked about this before. We have two main fluids in the body. We have blood, we have lymph. Blood accounts for about 20%. Lymph is about 80% of the fluid in our body. We And if, if you think about it, we spend so much time talking about um, lymphatic, or, sorry, blood, when we're talking about blood tests and, and, and you know, all the stuff we do with that. But we spend very little time talking about lymph, and I don't think we just have a very good understanding of it. But be that as it may, again, like 80%, this is 80% of the fluid in our, in our body. And, and the good way to go to think about this is the blood is essentially our kitchen. It delivers nutrients to tissues to cells so that they can do whatever they need to do cells like us we eat food for energy we also have to get rid of the waste we take what we need we need to get rid of the waste that's why we have toilets that's why we have bathrooms the cells and tissues need bathrooms too so they have the lymphatic system that is their sewer system that is their septic tank so if we look kind of at this here, you could kind of see how that works. So just as we eliminate waste in the toilet, waste eliminate through the lymphatic system. So they get carried through lymphatic vessels to septic tanks, which are basically like lymph nodes, where they break down waste products into things that can eventually be excreted through the urine. And that's essentially where the kidneys come in. Then this lymphatic waste is ultimately exposed of and we get rid of it so very similar thing if you think about it like that it's really important and like i kind of wrote here there's two really big types of waste so we have digestive waste which are byproducts things we don't absorb through the digestive tract when we don't those are essentially become stool so this is why going having at least one bowel movement a day ideally you're having as many bowel movements as meals you're having per day generally speaking that's going to be two to three 
if you're not having at least one a day, that's a big problem that we kind of need to address. That's usually step one. But then we have cellular waste, which I was just talking about. So cells take in nutrients that are delivered from blood. They go through their metabolic processes. They also need to get rid of waste that is done through the lymphatic system. So that's essentially what's going on here. And like I mentioned, 20% blood, 80% lymph. Uh, that's essentially what's going on. Now, now, what is the point of the lymphatic system? Like I said, it's the sewer system of the body. That's essentially what's going on. When there and what happens is a lot of this waste we get uh, is acidic in nature. Those acids need to be essentially disposed of through the lymphatic system. If this is backed up, if this lymphatic system is backed up, this is ultimately what we end up calling inflammation. This is pain, swelling, redness. All of this is from backup of waste in acidic body. This is what it means to an acidic body. We have inflammation. There's an acidic buildup. You could equivalent, equate this to fire. And this is an excess of waste. So I hope that makes sense. Now, if the body is going to try to get rid of wastes, the cells, generally speaking, have four ways to protect themselves. Water, fat tissue itself, cholesterol, which actually lowers inflammation, and then calcium. So yes, like I talked about, there is a caloric factor to this, but if we're not getting rid of the waste, you need to understand that there's going to be a backup and it's not going to work as well as it should. So again, if we're in an acidic environment, why would you use water if things are below the 7.365 pH? Water can help bring it back up to a degree. Fat is actually a genius move. Why? Because the liver, as we know, is our primary detoxifying organ. However, if it gets backed up, it has a cap of what it could hold. We live in a more toxic environment than probably, definitely any other, at least recorded um, humans, historically speaking. So it, it reaches a cap. If it can't reach with it right now, if it can't handle whatever toxins are coming in at the moment, the liver's like, no problem. Let's package it up in fat. Let's put it in fat tissue. We'll save it for later because we can't handle it right now. It's actually a genius move from a survivability standpoint, because if there are acidic wastes eventually floating around in the blood, that those are going to cause damage. Cholesterol. Now, cholesterol gets a lot of bad rap. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. And then calcium, although it could be really and other alkalizing uh, electrolytes. So this would be like sodium, potassium, it could be uh, magnesium. All of these are going to be very alkalizing on their own. So if something is more acidic, lower pH, these things can help raise it. So it's important to kind of keep that in mind. So there are hormones that play a role in health loss and in weight loss, waste loss as well. Hormones are going to be really big. So sleep is going to be something actually we'll come back to. This is out of order. But we have insulin. We're going to go through each of these. We have leptin and ghrelin, which kind of go together. We have, and I'll go through these pictures, cortisol. We have estrogens, and that's for men and women. Testosterone, again, for men and women. And then thyroid hormones. Now, there's more than that, but those are generally speaking the big ones. So we'll go through kind of each of these, and then I'll share my screen kind of as I need to uh, to kind of go through it. So insulin. So insulin gets a lot of rap, especially when we're talking about uh, blood sugar, right? It, it's pancreatic function. We need insulin for that. Insulin helps regulate the amount of glucose in the blood. So, but what insulin really does, it's really an energy controller and it's also a builder. So it's really important to kind of understand that we need insulin to bring in energy so that the cells can use what it needs to. Now, this hormone works by helping the body bring glucose into cells. So when you hear insulin, glucose into the cell. It's a good way to think of it. Now, sometimes insulin can cause weight gain if the cells absorb too much glucose and then the, the cells can't use them. Similar to like what we were talking about with the liver. We can't use this right now. It needs to be stored somewhere. 
if glycogen stores are all kind of filled up, it, it must become turn into fat tissue eventually. So if there is some sort of like pancreatic damage, insulin can do that. And this is part of the reason why we'll talk about later why strength training is so important. Then we have leptin and ghrelin. So ghrelin is triggered, uh, is used to trigger hunger. Leptin does the opposite. It's the sensation of fullness. So we have ghrelin that makes you feel hungry. Leptin is the feel full hormone. Now what's interesting, I mentioned sleep. When we're not getting enough sleep, ghrelin levels actually rise and leptin levels fall. So you feel more hungry, but not only that, as you're eating, you're not going to get that same trigger of I'm full, which means you're going to end up eating more. So is that really about, you know, is it, you know, more calories in? Like, just think about this for a second. Or is it a hormone imbalance where your sleep is thrown off that you're not actually getting the internal responses to say, hey, I'm not actually that hungry or hey, I'm full at the time you should. So it's important to kind of keep that in mind. Really important to kind of keep that in mind because these things are mostly hormonal imbalances that are mostly overlooked by the mainstream and they just don't want to talk about it either because it's too nuanced or it's just a lot easier to say, oh, hey, eat 2000 calories. If you go under, you will lose weight, which is just a preposterous way to look at things. Now, leptin, like I mentioned, is the satiety hormone. It essentially tells the brain that you've eaten enough, that 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 there are enough calories in, or so so that's an important part of it. Now, leptin's actually made by adipose tissue itself. Uh, the main role of it is to regulate fat storage and how many calories you eat and burn. Now, leptin, it like I said, is released by fat tissue. It travels to the brain through the bloodstream. It acts on the hypothalamus which hypothalamus, if you remember, we kind of talked about this, one foot in the endocrine system, one foot in the nervous system, it kind of connects the two. So we're getting an endocrine response, a hormone response, a hormone messenger, leptin, telling the nervous system, the brain, okay, we're good now. Ghrelin is mainly re released by the stomach. And it, it happens a little bit in the brain and in the small intestine uh, and the pancreas, but it's mostly in the stomach itself. Now, uh, now, its main function is to trigger hunger, the, the sensation of hunger that is done by ghrelin. Um, and it's made in the stomach and it kind of fluctuates throughout the day, depending on your food intake. Now, it's funny, like I noticed this when folks try intermittent fasting or something else, like if you generally eat at the same time every day, you'll notice whether you eat or not that you get hungry at specific times. That is actually ghrelin adapting to your body's schedule. And maybe say for, for whatever reason, if you've ever missed a meal and say you eat lunch at 12, right? At 12 noon. And for whatever reason, you just don't eat lunch that day. And it gets to one o'clock and all of a sudden you're not hungry and you could go. That is just the response of ghrelin slow, or not the response, the lack of response because it's just, you're not producing as much ghrelin. So you're not getting those same triggers. That's all it is. So it's hormone response. So a good way to look at this, again, let me share my screen. Okay. So we have a few different ways that food intake is kind of done. And again, if you join uh, using the link in my bio for the True Health Thursdays, you can check this out. I'll post this on YouTube later, but what controls food intake? We have three hormones, generally speaking. We have insulin, like we talked about from the pancreas. We have ghrelin from the stomach. We have leptin from the from fat tissue, adipose tissue. That is essentially how what controls what is hungry or what how we are hungry. What is hungry? A better way to look at it is, I think, is actually this picture, and and this is just ghrelin and leptin. But generally speaking, when we're hungry, gr we're going to have more ghrelin. It's going to tip the scales that way. Uh, the 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 stomach is going to produce more at the leptin. There's going to be less leptin produced when we're hungry. That flips what once we've eaten. The, the adipose tissue is going to produce more leptin. Ghrelin is going to be produced, uh, produce much less. It's going to be reduced quite a bit because then the body needs to kind of bring it in. So 
that is leptin and ghrelin. And those can be thrown off by a variety of things that we'll touch later on. So that's another thing. So next we have cortisol. Now cortisol, stress hormone, big one. This is a big one. So cortisol we know is, is generally speaking a catabolic hormone, um, it, which means it breaks things down. So we have anabolic, catabolic, catabolic breaks things down, anabolic builds things up. Technically speaking, insulin is an anabolic hor hormone, but story for another day. Um, cortisol, we know, is a glucocorticosteroid by de definition. It's produced by the adrenal glands, and that's triggered by the hypothalamic pituitary axis, uh, adrenal axis, I should say, which I do have a picture of somewhere. Somewhere here. We'll cover it. Um, so that's a big part of it. But what we know is as cortisol levels increase, this is our stress response, right? If we're in that sympathetic dominant mode. It's going to increase blood sugars. That glucose is going to be liberated from things like glycogen to go into the body because we need glucose now for our cells, specifically our muscles and our nervous system, so that we can fight for our lives or run away if we have to. That is what cortisol essentially does. And it is amazing. It is a beautiful system. And it is something that will literally keep us alive in the short term. What cortisol also does, and this is where it becomes a problem, is if this is something that is turned on all the time. Now, why? Part of what cortisol is going to stimulate is fat and carbohydrate metabolism for fast energy. Remember, fats and carbohydrates are our primary sources of energy. Ideally, carbohydrates, e either way, these things are going to be get turned into glucose for energy because that is the form of energy that the body needs. That is the form of energy that the brain really wants. Uh, but what happens is, you know, if we use this up, say, really fast, use up those glycogen stores, a couple things are going to happen here. First is we're going to get cravings for sweet, salty, high fat foods. Now, why is this important? Because we know for a fact that the food industry, particularly the big food industry, literally creates processed foods that are salty, sweet, and high fat to give you that cocaine dopamine spike to eat more. This is why, you know, if you have one Pringle, you end up eating half the two or, or something like that. It is because these things are created in a lab to hit all those dopamine responses. And this is why when you have something that's processed and is sweet, salty, high fat, they literally hit the same cocaine receptors, dopamine receptors in the brain that are similar to cocaine reactions to to the to as if you were doing cocaine and i use that because so many people have addictions to processed foods and don't put the two together but the response from a neurological standpoint is actually the same it's an it's an addiction and that's not to say, you know, this is not to, you know, justify it or, you know, say that you can't go through it. You absolutely can. And, and you know, you can break through that, but you need to understand it first. So if you have these cravings for sweet, salty, high fat foods all the time, chances are you're in a fight or flight, adrenal dominant, sympathetic dominant, use whatever uh, uh, HPA axis dysfunction all of these things they're all the same it's high cortisol you're going to use up or ideally use up uh you know whatever glucose stores you have uh fat stores you need in the short term to create energy and on the other side of that is going to be this response for things that are sweet salty high fat because of that response Important to understand that. Now, obviously, if we're not actually running for our lives or fighting for our lives or in like a truly life or death situation, which 99% of the time it isn't, what happens is after all this gets liberated, it's not actually being used by the brain, by the muscle tissue to survive. So what happens? It gets circulated. It's going to fill up the glycogen stores, but the glycogen stores are going to be filled up faster. There's going to be excess glucose. One, that's going to potentially raise your blood sugar, which leads to an issue with insulin. 
So you're starting to see how this is starting to come together. High stress can potentially lead to high blood sugar just because you're mobilizing glucose because of a stress response. If it's not stored as glycogen, the rest of it's going to end up getting stored as fat. This is why you'll actually see people, especially at the extreme end, so like Cushing's or, or, or depression, it gets stored as fat and usually that's around the belly. So when you see those types of body shapes, particularly around the midsection, usually you can say there's some adrenal dysfunction potentially, there's a, a, a stress response that's constantly going off that's playing a role in this. Important to understand that. Estrogen. Okay, estrogen is also something that can play a role in, in um, weight gain and loss. Most notably, uh, so first of all, estrogens have a lot of different functions. They support the growth and regeneration of uh, the female reproductive organs. They help regulate the menstrual cycle. They affect the growth of breast tissue. Healthy libido helps actually maintain healthy cholesterol levels, which is really cool. Helps maintain a strong pelvic floor. Helps support this, the, the health of skin, hair, bones. Um, it also helps uh, with mood, brain function. Um, and, and this is why, and this is why it happens all the time, but, and I understand there are cases where you may or may not have to have something like a hysterectomy, but, but you need, these organs are not, they're not optional. So, you know, if you have say a hysterectomy, then, you know, unfortunately you will probably have to be on bioidentical hormones for the rest of your life because you're actually taking out an organ that is supposed to produce something that you now eliminated from the body. It's the same thing with thyroid hormones. If you've had a thyroid ablation, this is where medications unfortunately have to come in because if you are literally removing body parts, that is different. Can you regenerate things before you get to that point? For most people, yes, you actually can. But once you cut it out and go through the surgery, that's a different ball game. And it's important to kind of understand that. Be that as it may, if estrogen levels are too high or too low, it can cause weight gain. So it's important to understand that. Uh, it, it, it can really go a long way. High levels of estrogen can actually irritate cells that produce insulin. It could irritate the pancreas. It could actually lead to insulin resistance. And with that, sometimes comes along weight gain. So that's important. Um, and here's like a visual that I kind of pulled up. Let me kind of share this. Okay. So we see here, estrogens have a lot of different actions. Uh, now the adrenals actually produce some estrogen as well. That's why males uh, also have estrogen and that's not a bad thing. Uh, but there's a lot of different things here. So libido, mental health, memory, muscle strength, uh, bone strength as well. Um, obviously, it's going to control or be part of everything that goes along with your cycle. Um, you know, it could, it really helps with bone health, increase cholesterol and bile. So we talked about cholesterol storage. There's a lot that estrogens actually do. Now, on the flip side of that, we have testosterone. Now, testosterone, uh, again, Females have testosterone, just like males have estrogens. It's just in different amounts, and that's okay. Um, but what happens, it's basically responsible for most of the same stuff, just in, in the male sex, right? So sex drive, erections, the development of male sexual organs, bone mass, muscle mass, that's already sounding familiar, uh, distribution of fat the development the development of facial hair body hair etc testosterone's involved in all that then we have our thyroid hormones which i don't have a good picture of but it's important to talk about thyroid too now thyroid is essentially the gas pedal of the body it controls all of the aspects essentially how fast is your internal body working that's the job essentially of what it does. So it's going to control your metabolism. It's going to control how well your body's your absorb and utilize glucose, how you use amino acids to build proteins for growth, how you utilize fats, your heartbeat strength, your heartbeat rate, your respiratory rate, how deep you breathe, 
Uh, the rate of calcium absorption from the blood and the intestines and the bone and the kidneys. Why? Because that's the, the parathyroid, which are essentially nodules on the back of the thyroid gland. They're responsible for calcium absorption and regulation in the body. In hypothyroidism, generally speaking, you're going to have lowered function of the thyroid glands, which usually can we lead to weight gain. Now, why is this important? Because in my opinion, and I've done other videos on this, is that I am yet to see a thyroid problem that is outright a thyroid problem and does not have a stress or adrenal component. Now, why is that important? Because we already talked about the adrenal glands, cortisol, right? High stress response. So if you have a high stress response, high sympathetic response, that is going to lower your thyroid function. They can't both be active at the same time. So what's happening and why is this important? So let me share this again, because this is important. This is an important thing to kind of understand is that if you have a physical, chemical, emotional stress, there's only three, physical, chemical, emotional, stress response, talked about that. What's going to happen in a stress state? trying to survive heart rate's going to increase blood pressure is going to increase blood sugar is going to increase uh cholesterol cortisol all stress hormones these are all going to go up why because we need to survive in the moment we need to make it to the next five minutes from now but what decreases so gut blood supply actually like only a quarter of the blood that would normally go to your gut to help with digestion it all gets shunted to the muscles to the brain to the nervous system so that, again, you can survive right now. The immune system, but where is most of your immune system located? By the gut, it, about 80% of it. So there's going to be lowered immune system function in a stress state. Your body's going to basically stop regenerating itself if it's in a constantly stressed state. You need to be in a calm, relaxed state if you want to experience regeneration. Also, it's going to basically shut down a lot of your glands as well. So... That includes the thyroid and also other things. So TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. This is not actually a thyroid hormone. It is something made in the brain so that you can to tell the thyroid what to do. So you're going to have low thyroid function in a high stress response. So what I see in most cases is it's not really hypothyroid. I'm sure, that might show up on lab work, but if you ask folks who are in this space, the window closed. What, what just happened? If you ask folks who are in this place, space and, and who are aware of it, they will tell you that thyroid, just checking for thyroid stuff in general is not very reliable in general. So, and you need to have all the markers, which... Very few doctors actually run. That's a separate story for another day. So what's going on? And I apologize. I don't know why my Google Chrome, I think, just crashed. But we got it back. So let me share this again. So we have, this is what we're building towards. We have our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. And they basically work as opposites. So we have, I'm going to. Try to make this a little smaller so it's a little easier to see. That's too small. You gotta make it a little bigger. Okay. So, but essentially what's happening, I know this is a little small and ne maybe next time I'll write it out, but what's happening here is your gut function in a sympathetic dominant state is essentially gonna get shut down. Uh, you know, you're not going to, you're going to lose the sensation to go to the bathroom, things like that, because it's not important in that time. So what is going to happen, though, is, you know, you're going to get blood shunted to those things you need to survive. So the lungs are going to dilate, the heartbeat's going to increase, blood supply is going to go again to the muscles, so you can fight or or run away if you need to. But these are all the things that get shut down. Liver, pancreas function, stomach function, intestine function, kidney function, bladder. All of these get essentially shut down or really minimized 
when we're in that fight or flight state. So imagine that you're in it for such a long period of time or throughout the day, you're constantly stressed. You're running to work. You're going to be late for this deadline. You're going to, you got to run home because something happened, whatever it is, that's going to affect your digestion, your immune system, your thyroid. So this is why this stuff is so important because if we don't even get to the bottom of that and at least understand that we're in a stress state all of the time, it's going to lead to some real issues. Now, there are other things outside of that. So those are the big hormones. Now, why did we take all this time to kind of talk about that? Because if there is excess weight or something else going on in that nature, it means that we have to address all the things that could throw any of those hormones off because the hormones, the hormonal system, the endocrine system is essentially like a web of checks and balances that are always looking to balance each other. And there's a lot of things you may have hear of things like endocrine disruptors. These are hormone disruptors. A lot of them are what they're known as xenoestrogenic. They mimic estrogens in the body. This includes, believe it or not, things like glyphosate. A lot of pesticides do this. If you look into the work of someone like Shauna Swan, I believe her book is Countdown, if I remember correctly. Um, she talks about this more from like the framework of men in general are, are lower, have much have much lower testosterone levels now, or like a 30-year-old now has the testosterone level of like a 60 year old 50 years ago. Some those numbers might be off a little bit, but somewhere in that ballpark, that's pretty scary. But a lot of that is from all of these endocrine disrupting, the xenoestrogen like materials that modern folks are exposed to. And a lot of that is through the food supply, things like glyphosate, atrazine. Um, a lot of these pesticides are estrogenic based. So, when we're seeing not only lower testosterone levels in men, but now in women, PCOS, a lot of uh, cycle issues. We were just talking about hysterectomies. Uh, like all of these things are more common now. And could it be because we're bringing in all of these excess estrogens that are throwing off all of these hormones, which can affect your ability to lose weight? So you're starting to see how all of that starts to play a role here. I hope so. With glyphosate in particular, there's a lot here. So actually in 2010, Monsanto actually patented glyphosate as an antimicrobial. Um, and it, But the problem is it actually damages a lot of our beneficial gut bacteria more so than the pathogenic ones. And remember, the, the universe is fractal. So we are humans in an ecosystem of say a neighborhood and an ecosystem of a city to a state to a country to the whole planet we have ecosystems inside of us each one of us if you were to count up all the cells in our body are only 10 percent human the other 90 percent are not us and if you were to look at all the the genetic the dna inside of us one percent less than that is actually human over 99% of the genetic material inside of us is not human. It's bacterial in nature. It's viral. It could be fungi. It's an ecosystem inside of us. So next time, you know, if you're feeling really like let down or, oh, you were told you have this mutation or an MTHFR mutation, understand that like inside of you, that is less than 1%. And that's one gene. So 1% of that. So don't get caught up in this. Understand that this is an ecosystem. All of this stuff works in fractals. You're seeing as we treat the planet more poorly by spraying most of our foods, by using petroleum-based pesticides, uh, by depleting our soil, we're seeing the health of the planet deteriorate. We're also seeing the health of the average human being, especially here in America, deplete. You could say, oh, it's causation, uh, cor uh, correlation, there's no causation. Well, at some point you have to zoom out. And like, as particularly when we're talking about things like glyphosate, where we know we have actually been, you know, have been shown in court that this is killing people. 
and it's still causing issues. It's still out there on a regular basis. What is going to change the health of human beings is realizing that we're not actually individuals. We are individual ecosystems that are parts of bigger ecosystems. And everything, all of it, is connected. This affects how we think, how we breathe, what we put in our bodies, who we spend time with, who we socialize with, uh, what we drink. Uh, all of it is related. So I know that sounds great, but what we need to understand is like, this is a diversity. Like, this is a diversity issue. So, what does this all mean at the end of the day? Like, when we're talking about what do we do? How do we get out of this? Like, what is the way to actually start losing weight to in, in a healthful way where we're not restricting calories and pretending we're calculators when we're not and i understand it's a headache i really do because i was there i came up through that that gym bro science whatever you want to call it space that's how i got that's why i went to chiropractic school because i wanted to go into sports medicine because i worked with other athletes that was what did it just as you go down that path and understand that all these things are connected i would highly suggest going back and watching something like food inc which is one of my favorite documentaries of all time. Uh, you can watch Seeds of Death if you want to watch more about um, uh, glyphosate and pesticide usage. So really important to kind of understand that. Now, there are emotional parts of this too, right? Because we have physical, chemical, emotional stress. What we need to understand with that is where is most of our, we talked about dopamine a little bit before. That's our reward neurotransmitter but even more specific than that it's actually the build up to the reward so it's not the reward itself that spikes dopamine it's the movement towards it if that makes sense because what happens is if you reach it it's going to drop and then you need to find a new reason to motivate yourself right now what happens is serotonin which is another hormone that really makes you feel good a neurotransmitter that makes you feel good and dopamine are primarily created by bacteria in the gut so most of your serotonin and dopamine is created in the gut that is then brought up to the brain so you know if, if that's one part of it is understanding the connection again between the gut and the brain and that element of it but the other part of it that's really important here that I hope comes across as like maybe sometimes, especially from an emotional standpoint, a lot of it comes down to just spending time with yourself and getting to know who you really are. At the end of the day, you have to realize we everything is one here. We are all actually one collective consciousness together. But we are because of so much time on social media, because of so many distractions and bright lights and all these things competing for your attention at the same time we don't take the time to really sit down and be like who are we who am i what you are actually is just source you could call it uh divine you could call it uh god's creation god's image and likeness uh that was something i heard a lot i went to catholic school but whatever it is it's all the same it's it, it's the same concept point is like you have to realize at the end of the day you are source and from your mind, you can actually create reality because all power is, is the ability to have a thought and have it manifest. And the quicker you can get from thought to manifestation, that is all power is. Power is not a bad thing. You, your mind, is the most powerful tool that you have. Why? Because that is the generator of the thoughts. And as you start to sit with yourself and get more comfortable and really peel back those layers with what's going on, you can get to a point where you realize, oh, I know I'm outsourcing my power to this one and that one to make that decision. Or I'm outsourcing you know, my power to this person because he's going to fix my problem or she's going to fix my problem. And when you peel all that crap back, you realize, oh, at the end of the day, I'm the one who is giving that power away. I'm the one 
that can make the difference. Now, there's a lot going against against us right now. Like I said, we have literally foods that, that create cocaine addictions in the body. And, and it might seem like, well, holy crap, how do we get away from that? How do we get around that? It's not always fun. <laughs> it's not. If anyone's ever tried to wean themselves off caffeine or any other drug, you would know it's not fun all the time. And I, I've been through that myself. When I weaned myself off caffeine cold turkey, it was a rough week. It was about four or five days. I had a pounding headache. And you know what? Sorry about that. At the end of the day, I felt a lot better. So it starts with by realizing that you're not the victim. That yes, there's a lot of stuff against you. The, the modern society is not meant for you to be healthy. You have to active. You have to actively participate in your own well-being. It is not that easy, but anything worthwhile is, and it starts by thinking, "Oh, I can get there," and don't put a cap, a time cap on it. This is something you're going to be doing for the rest of your life. So expand that timeline, and the more people that can expand the timeline, that can see, okay, this is just the step to the next step your chances of success are going to be much higher than someone who says I have to lose 20 pounds in four days or in a week because they're not seeing the bigger picture. They're living in a space of lack and fear and they're not living in a space of creation and, and really wanting to create, to create a life that is going to benefit not only them in the short term, both physically and financially, but in the long term. And when you can extend that timeline and, and really see it through, that's where you're going to start seeing improvements. So where does this come from? What are some of the things that can be really toxic? One of the things, and this is not very popular in this space, is going to be very high protein diets. I'm sorry to say it, but this is goes back to basic anatomy and physiology. What we know is when you have a high, a high protein burden in the body, that is going to tax your kidneys. When I do iris analysis, analyses, I will say almost everyone I see has some sort of kidney weakness. And you can see it on the charts. It, it, it's towards six o'clock. This is primarily, now, now the weakness is not something that generally is brought on to them, but a lot of that comes from what's brought on long uh, from previous generations. But so many people have poor functioning kidneys. And why is this important? Because where does the, does the lymphatic system actually drain to? It's ultimately the kidneys. And that's how we get rid of waste. So if we're constantly clogging that up, with a lot of excess protein that is going to affect your kidney function long-term. Another thing that, uh, yes, actually fear. Thank you for bringing that up, Victoria Johnson. Fear. So fear is actually the emotion that's associated with the kidneys and bladder. So if you're constantly in a state of fear, that can also affect kidney function. So there is an emotional component to this. If you want to look into, um, some of the origins of, of Chinese medicine and where this comes from. There's there's energetic touch points with that. So that's a big one. Uh, we we really don't need a ton of protein because really all protein is, is, if you think about it, they're chemical messengers and they're building blocks. And you can't actually absorb protein anyway. It has to be broken down into the amino acids, which if we were to use an analogy are essentially letters of an alphabet. And we can't absorb words. We can't absorb sentences. We have to break each of those down into the individual letters. Then those letters are reassembled in the body wherever we need them. We, a good example of this would be something like gluten, since everyone has a gluten sensitivity now. And that's really not a real sensitivity. It's a glyphosate poisoning, but that's a separate story. However, gluten is, is a protein. In and of itself, there's nothing wrong with, with gluten. It is just a protein structure. It gives the plant structure. It holds it together, hence the name glue, gluten, glue. What happens is the gut gets irritated enough that it actually allows these things to get through and it causes damage. So what is your answer? It's primarily going to be things like, like fruits and vegetables, ideally as many raw ones as you can do. That's going to, that's going to do you a lot better, especially when it comes to detox. That's going to be something that's going to play a really big role. That's got to be the primary focus of what you're eating on a regular basis. 
because that's what we're designed to eat. And I'll talk about that in a second. But the other thing and getting away from your standard American stuff, that's going to be your dairy type products, your refined grains. Again, the excess, the, the meats, these are all very acidic. And, and we're going to get into the energetics of food in a second, too. But other things that, that can disrupt your, your hormones, which is what we talked about, glyphosate, makeups, cosmetics, seed oils, a lot of the foods we just talked about, processed sugars, ge ge genetically modified foods, heavy metals from injectables, from uh, if you have amalgam fillings, like really work with the dentist and try to get that done. Uh, uh, antibiotics, medications. And if you're not taking antibiotics or medications, then where's your water coming from? Because there's residues of those in a lot. But if you want to make this really simple, what you eat, drink, breathe, put on your skin and what you think all matters. So how do we start healing? Sleep and stress management, I would say is, is step one, believe it or not, because so many of us are in this fight or flight state all the time that just getting to a place where you can just sh shut off be quiet and still find the space for yourself, even if it's five minutes a day to start and, and really get into a space where you can get in control of your sleep. That's going to be huge. So that would be step one. Strength training. I know this is something that not everyone loves to do, but having more muscle mass will make you not only more resilient, but also more efficient at utilizing energy in the body. Even if it's like a couple days a week, start with that. Uh, like it, it, muscle tissue itself actually requires more calories, energy to maintain than fat tissue. So the more lean muscle mass that you have on your frame, just by just existing, I'm 170 pounds. So if I was say 10% body fat and someone next to me was 20, I would burn more weight than him, even if I just sat here all day. Just because the muscle mass itself actually needs more muscle to maintain itself or needs more energy to maintain itself, which is actually kind of cool. Then we have to talk about uh, detox and we have to talk about other ways that we can kind of, um, how do we get into this? So I'm going to share my screen one more time here and this will be good for YouTube, but um so I posted this on IG this week, but starting with this, this kind of like is a, is a graph of what's really going on here. So most of the stuff, most of your typical American stuff is going to be down here and detoxification is always happening. It's just, are you accelerating it or are you slowing it down? The, the higher you move up on this pyramid, the more you can push into detoxification. So you can detoxify even with cooked vegetables and things like that. If you go to all raw, that's going to push it even further. If you go to fruits and leafy greens, that's going to push it even further. If you go into juicing, that's going to push it even further. This is something that I work with people one-on-one -on, -one on. So, and I didn't even get into the energetics of food today. I've already been on here an hour. I'm not going to push it. We'll talk about that next time. But if you really want to get these detoxification pathways up and running, if you really want to get to the bottom of why you're struggling to get rid of this waste and get rid of the weight, then what I would highly recommend is, you know, A, if you can do it with someone else to guide you through it, I would recommend it and I would be more than happy to do it with you. So if you're on Instagram, you could DM me detox, let's call it that. And we could set up a time to chat so we could talk about how we can work together for three weeks, for three months, 12 weeks, get you started on this, put you on a path where you have all the information, all the education, we talk about all this stuff in way more detail over 12 weeks, work together to get to a point where you could become an efficient, healthier person. And then more importantly, not have to work with someone like me again down the road. And the education, having the fundamentals, having the information at your fingertips is where you start. And then it becomes the practical application. And that's where I can help. So if you really want to detox, if you really want to take your health to the next level and not be another American statistic where, you know, there, there's hormones all over the place, you know, just sick, fat and tired is always the kind of thing that we use with that. And you really want to get an answer to where you're at. 
then like I said, DM me detox, shoot me an email, Dr. Vincent Esposito at insideouthealthwellness.com. Uh, get in touch with me somewhere and we could talk about how to put this roadmap together for you so that you're not a victim and you're in control of your life because that's ultimately what this is about. So I love you. I know this was a lot. I'll end up posting this on YouTube if you want to check it. So I'm going to record, uh, bring this down. But I hope you have a wonderful weekend. I'll see you guys later. Have a good one.